Kids on fire, come on up. Oh, we're going to talk about you this morning. We're talking about people that can't see. Oh, you're not blind? I thought you were blind there for a minute. I couldn't see your eyes. I can't see anything. Okay. I can't see anything, but we can see you. So, uh, have you ever seen somebody with a little mirror, and they're trying to shine it on somebody's face way over there? You ever seen that? You ever seen that? It does? It blinds them? It either blinds them or it shows them what is going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or they know somebody's help, looking for them. Help, help. That's right. It's a help. It's a sign for help. So, Monty, have you ever done that? Wait, so his glasses on? Have you ever shined a mirror in somebody? Somebody's eyes way far away? It's in the Bible. It is. We're going to study this morning about how God, I don't know what he used, but he flashed a light and Saul fell on his knees and he was blind. Yeah. Yeah, he couldn't see for three days. Light can blind you. And if there are no lights, that will also blind you, right? No, I can see in the dark. You can see in the dark. Brendan, can you see in the dark? Can you see in the dark? I can see in the dark. Oh, okay. Me too. I can't see. I can completely see in the dark. Well, we need to pay attention to when, uh, when God's trying to get our attention. I'll just put it that way. You can think about what that means. Maybe ask who you came with this morning to tell you after the sermon. All right? Thanks for coming up. Let's let the ladies go first, please. This one, two, three, four, five, six. This could be like a madhouse. All right. You go for it. Thanks. Well, good morning. It's good to be here today. I'm just glad to be standing on two feet, frankly. I think we've moved all of my parents' possessions at least three times this week. About two-thirds of them are in other homes, blessing other people right now. We're grateful for that. And uh, other people with more energy think they want to do that again next weekend, so I'm, uh, I'm trying to figure out if I'm one of those or not, but we'll see how that works out. Well, I... I I knew better this morning than to start with what I wanted to do with the kids. I wanted to talk to them about if they'd ever seen a raging bull and I could just envision them all turning into one on the stage. <laughs> By the time I got that swept up, we'd be, we'd be ready to go home today. You know, if we unleash that energy. You, uh, you had some fun with them, Christina, today. I think they had a lot of energy, didn't they, this morning? <laughs> She took them out back and let them run around a little bit. Thanks, I had a better table because of that. <laughs> we are going to study a raging bull this morning, Acts chapter 9. That's uh, the meaning of the first few sentences that we read about. This man named Saul. Now Saul, still breathing threats, Envision a bull with a cloud of smoke coming out of his nostrils. That's the, that's the picture. Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. So if he, may found, if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now... Uh, there were a lot of synagogues in Damascus. We understand there were dozens actually there. Um, this, this was a group of people on their way to Damascus. And Saul is leading the charge. And he's really kind of ramped it up. 
Uh, this is Saul, the persecutor who held the coats at the stoning of Stephen. Wasn't one of the participants, not real sure why. He sort of took a sideline seat at that event, but he is no longer on the sidelines. He's on the front charge to find these Christians. And I, I find it interesting that this quickly, we're seeing the word murder associated with what he's thinking. He calls himself a blasphemer and a murderer at the end of his ministry, and, and I've kind of let that soak in a little bit, but, but that's the way he's described and uh, so when we say threats, it's not an idle threat. And you have to understand that some people lost their lives at the hands of Saul or because of his efforts. He gets letters which would equate in our day to an arrest warrant. The Sanhedrin, the court that murdered Jesus, using the mob violence in the hand of the Roman soldier, uh, had the authority to say, yes, these people have scattered from Jerusalem. They need to come back and answer for their crimes. Go round them up, tie them up, bring them back before the court. And what's interesting is we meet the person who comes to speak to him. The people all the way in Damascus knew what was coming. So this was no fly-by-night, quick, secret op operation in any means. Now... <laughs> Our series title is Turning to God, Turn to God. In this story, which person would you pick to try to turn to God? Would it be Saul? Or would you say, well, you know, you know God's really powerful, but uh, there are some things that just can't be done. Kind of like Jonah, right? You know, Nineveh is a wicked, wicked city. I mean, you know, God... Uh, could we go somewhere where it's not quite so bad? God just has a whole different view of that than we do sometimes. And so verses 3 and 4, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, okay, Saul, Saul, can't miss that. Why are you persecuting me? Now, this is a large entourage. We're going to bring back people from multiple synagogues. We're going to have them bound. You know, you have to have people to assist you in this uh, endeavor. Uh, and at this point, God just stops the train. And it's, you know, I've, I've likened it to a raging bull, and now I'll liken it to a locomotive. It's like duty-bound to go grab these people and get them rounded up. Later in the book, I believe it's to Agrippa, or Agrippa, the one that says to him, you know, your great learning has made you mad. Saul was quite educated. Uh, Gamaliel was no slouch. He's one of the ones that warned the Jewish authorities, the same Sanhedrin, as they were about to deal with Peter and John. You know, if this is of God, you might not want to get in his way. Well, Gamaliel was Saul's uh, rabbi, and uh, that's not the only learning that Saul had. He, he was apparently recognized to be quite an educated man. And so he was very sure of himself, and when you add that his passion was powered by his desire to do God's will. You know, even in our world today, we say there's nothing more dangerous than a religious person who thinks they're on a, on a mission for God himself. And we understand we have enemies in Afghanistan right now that they're not heathen in the sense that they don't believe in God. They're on a mission. They're on a mission to exterminate immoral, godless people like these Americans. Kind of shoe on the other foot. But who really wants to be in front of that train as it comes down the tracks? This is a dangerous place. And so, Saul, who has been confronted, the train has stopped. He's on his knees. He's blind. And he said, verses 5, through seven, who are you, Lord? Now the word Lord is the word that is used when you say sir, okay? But let's say 
if a bright light blinds you and you're on your knees and you look up to heaven, you're not saying, sir. <laughs> you're saying, okay, who are you? If I'm persecuting you, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up, enter the city, it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And later we're told, and Saul retells this twice more in the book of Acts, that there was a sound, they heard the sound, but they couldn't make the words out. And they were clear that Saul was talking to someone. So, you know, think of it as I'm hearing this sound and then someone's interacting and you're really, really confused because this, there are just a lot of things that don't make sense about this as a bystander. I am Jesus. Now Saul, Saul's heard the name of Jesus, okay? <laughs> Stephen was quite clear who he was talking about for one, and they, he was not the only one who preached to Jesus. Of course, Philip and all the apostles have been doing that. So what has Saul been thinking as he's heard about Jesus? Well, pff, he can't be the Messiah. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. I mean, when he was crucified, that said, no, that cannot be the Messiah. God does not raise up cursed messiahs. That just is, that's got to be a lie. That's got to be false teaching. Plus, if there's, any, if there's any doubt about some other forms of execution, like, I mean, there are people who, you know, were still alive after they've been hanged, and you're like, really? Well, no one ever said that about a crucifixion, okay? No one. He was dead. He was dead for sure. And the preaching is, he's alive. Now, you know how our world is. You know, when we start pushing the bounds of, of uh, okay, common sense, logic, science, <laughs> our world is very defensive. And even Saul is a devout Jew. <sighs> alive? Alive? Is that possible? And this one who spoke against the temple? I mean, that was the charge. I gotta wonder if Saul wasn't around at the, at the trial of Jesus. I mean, you know, he's not a young man. He's not that young. It wasn't that long ago that they were charging him with saying he could destroy the temple and three days rebuild it. And what's the first thing they say about Peter and John? Well, they're speaking out against the temple. What they say about Stephen? He's speaking out against the temple. What is it, this obsession with the temple? Well, that's the, that's the deal breaker on these people can't be telling the truth. And yet, he is confronted with one reality. One fact. I am Jesus. Uh, no wonder he's on his knees, and no wonder this stops the train. Saul got up from the ground, verses 8 and 9. And though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. Leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now Jews fast but that word is not actually used here. This is one of those, this is not a ritual fast, okay? This is, I just can't eat or drink. This is like when your relative's in ICU and, and everyone's offering you food and you, and you don't want any. And yeah, it's a fast, but it's, it's, there's something bigger on my heart. Now we're introduced to Ananias, Good thing, because you've never heard of Ananias, have you? <laughs> there are several verses here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip to verse 13 next. But Ananias is approached by God. You need to go help Saul. <laughs> uh, Lord, this guy came to Damascus to do us in. 
you're surely talking about someone else. No, I've chosen him. You go tell him. You go get, help him regain his sight. This is what I want to do. Saul was told to expect someone named Ananias. And so, he goes to Saul and gives his speech. But he says, uh, Lord, verse 13, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. He has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. The Lord said, Go. He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. All right, envision a surgeon. A surgeon chooses the instrument with which he will now do his work. God has selected someone to do a very specific job, and then now we know that there really weren't very many people who could have done what Paul did. I have selected this one. And Ananias, quit worrying about how much harm he's doing you. He's going he's gonna to be on the receiving end of that harm that he's been causing. I'll show him how much suffering is coming. Well, this is how I would summarize what we're seeing and bring a little bit of a warning to us. This entire incident is about one thing. It's about meeting Jesus. Period. There's no angel that says, oh, Saul, go on the road to Damascus, and there'll be, you know. There's no intermediary, there's no angel, there's no move of the Spirit or that sort of thing. I mean, like there's one person that, that's going to get Saul's attention, and that's the one he thinks is dead. I mean, this is a raging bull, this is a charging locomotive. Who can stay on the train? How can that be done? Jesus. And when I say there are no words, okay, yeah, there was a little conversation here, but when you look at the conversation, the entire conversation is, who are you? I am Jesus. That's it. Go to the city. That's where you're going to get the words. So like the angel who says, let's get, get you know, Philip, go down this road, you know, there, there's guidance, there's, there's getting people together, but Jesus is not going to preach the gospel to Saul except that he did, <laughs> all in the sentence, I am Jesus. Good news, I'm alive. Saul says, That's not, that is not good at all. I, I don't know what to do with that information. Saul trusted in his religion. When he describes his life under Judaism, he will tell you, uh, I was circumcised the eighth day. I kept the law perfectly. I'm blameless where the law is concerned. How much zeal did I have? Well, I persecuted the church, didn't I? He, he could list his achievements, and he does that many times because he's dealing with these same Jews who understand that kind of a lifestyle. But I'm telling you, Saul was not saved because he was without Jesus. And now he's confronted with Jesus. Secondly, I find it incredible that almost every commentary that I read wants to make the light and the encounter on the road his salvation experience. Oh good, now he's saved. Sorry. He's confused, that's what he is. He's not saved. Jesus said, I am Jesus. He didn't say, now, Saul, believe in me and you're saved. He didn't say that. I don't get that Saul is really ready to believe in Jesus at this place. He's really confused. I showed you the things that are probably running around in his head. He's got three days to mull this over and he's just, he is in a mess. He can't even eat or, or drink. So I'm sorry, you, you really can't go to this and find the word salvation or find any hint of any kind of interaction that would take Saul to the point of salvation. It's just not in the text. 
So he thinks he's saved without Jesus, and some people are, you know, thinks he's saved just because he's seen Jesus. Well, he didn't see Jesus. He was blind. He heard Jesus, and all Jesus said was, I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. Go get some information. That's it. Sounds like Jesus thinks there's more to be done and heard. Why would he tell him to go where he would be told if he was already saved? There's just no rhyme or reason to that. I, I don't understand how our religious world continues to confuse the most important thing that's to be done by each of us and that is our encounter with God that takes us to a place of salvation before Him. All right, verses 17 through 19. Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Well, this is like lightning speed. I mean, we've got a raging bull and a charging locomotive, and, and boom, we're all the way to receiving the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit. These are, these are interesting words in this, in this verse. Uh, as in the rest of the book of Acts, we see this connection, starting in Acts chapter 2, that baptism has some kind of connection to the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that Saul, the Jew, is being promised that he needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit because that's not really a concept that was taught about. I mean, okay, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on Samson and he killed this many Philistines, all right? And Saul, do you need the Holy Spirit? No, I was killing Christians pretty good without it. I mean, you know, what does this mean to him even? Whatever Ananias said, the sight came immediately, the baptism was described as pretty immediately, and the mission is to fill him with the Holy Spirit, and that's really all we're told. It doesn't make a very good five steps to salvation, frankly. It's a, it's a bullet train to get you right there. And then the next verse, it's actually a comma at the end of that sentence, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. Whoa. All who were hearing him continued to be amazed and they were saying, Is this not he who is in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name? Who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Okay, folks, this, these verses are the center of the story. Now, I realize the drama of the story, is, you know, the bright light and the conversation with Jesus is certainly high on the list. But what happened to Saul as a result of these experiences and the things that occurred is that the person who came to kill the Christians is now proving that he was wrong and they are right. And he is confounding the people who were glad to see him come because they were going to help, you know, Saul was going to help get rid of these crazy Christians that have come along. And now he's debating them. Jesus is the Son of God. That's Saul's conclusion. If you'd asked him on the road, I would submit to you he didn't know what to say. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Jesus I've heard of. I, you mean this is true? I can't accept that. I've got to think about that. I, I don't know. I can't deal with that. That's, that's a curse. You, you spoke against the temple. I've I, I got to deal with this. I've got to reconcile this somehow. Well, he's reconciled it. He's done. He is the Son of God, period. Now, here's my summary of, of the things that occurred. The, the things on the left are the things that happened too. Well, maybe one of the ones on the right also. Ananias came and laid hands on Saul. Now we've seen that significantly described when the apostles lay hands on someone, they get the power to perform miracles, for instance. But laying on of hands is, is an ordination sort of thing. You've been selected as God's chosen instrument. We'll start with those scales on your eyes. 
And so he laid hands on him and said that about filling with the Holy Spirit and the scales fell and he could see. He was healed. Once again, the third time, third week in a row, we have a non-apostle who comes and something happens that's miraculous. I would submit to you that God can do what he wants to when he wants to. I think you already believe that. But if you think you're a nobody, <laughs> like Ananias, that just appears on the scene and that's, this is your one story, your 15 minutes of fame, do not doubt that God can do powerful things through your hands. Especially if he tells you to go do it. You can argue with him, but you should really get after it. Go do it. Restore his sight, fill him with the Holy Spirit. That's your mission. Go to Saul. And it says Saul was strengthened. That came from the outside. He took food. He was baptized. It, it, it brought his world back into harmony. And it brought it back into focus. And immediately he's out preaching the Jesus he came to destroy. Now these are things Saul did, but as you look at the list, you kind of realize he, it's almost not really under his power that he did these things. I mean, he was led. That means I can't see. Yes, I'll follow you where you're going. Uh, yes, Saul's the one that allowed himself to be led, but he was led by others. Not exactly the raging bull that started the story. He fasted, but I've already mentioned this. I mean, he couldn't eat. Again, I don't see this as a ritual fast. I'll say, oh, I need to get spiritual here. Let me, let me do without food. Maybe God will come and explain to me what's going on. No, he was just beside himself. And he just couldn't eat. Food was not important right now. He was baptized. I've pointed this out many times. People try to say, well, baptism, that's a work. No, it isn't. Faith is a work. That's what Jesus said. The work that you need to do is believe that I am the Son of God. That's what he told the Jews. Baptism is something that happens to us. Saul, so go be baptized. Now, I know there are a lot of ways to baptize someone. Uh, a lot of big people have looked down at me and wondered why in the world I'm going to take them backward and, and are they ever going to breathe again and get out of that water? Because do I, can I really get them out of the water? You know? Other people just bend over and they go down and that's that. Some people just go straight down and they're underwater. You know, that, that's not important. The important thing is, it is an immersion experience. And it is something that happens to you. We submit to baptism. We allow it to happen. This is not a work. This is not something we think we're earning anything. This is, I need to die. I need to be buried. I need to come up different. And boy, did he come up different. He came up preaching. I mean, he knew the Old Testament. When he reordered the story to include Jesus who was crucified, he knew all the things about the Messiah and he could, he could argue that with the best of them. Immediately. Well educated. He just needed to know who Jesus was. That, that was the puzzle that wasn't going to fit. Later, he's going to uh, retell his conversion in chapter 22. And he says uh, that Ananias came and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I, I looked up at him, Paul says, and he said, and this is, this is a little more words, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. Why? Because you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. We're going to make Saul an apostle. An apostle is an ambassador and must be an eyewitness of the Lord after the resurrection. Saul was apparently not until this day. But if he's going to be my chosen instrument and he's going to go to the Gentiles, he's got, to, he's got to have this encounter. I'm Jesus. I'm alive. Obviously, he believed it. <laughs> Obviously, faith was involved. But God saw it that Saul needed to know his will. He needed to put the 
puzzle piece of Jesus into the will that, that Saul thought he already understood. He needed to see and hear and be a witness of what he had seen and heard. What happened? I was going along. There was a flash of light. I'm on my knees. I hear this voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus. Done. The witness part of this is done. And now he understands God's will because he had so many times discovered it. It is amazing that one previously so hostile is now preaching Jesus to everyone. And so Acts 22.16 in this account ends, And now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins. Calling on His name. I'm going to talk about calling on His name tonight. That, that's a key phrase, and it's important, and I don't want to spend 15 more minutes with this. So let's draw a few lessons, and we'll come back to that. In fact, we'll come back to the whole verse. Number one, this is broad daylight. This is public stuff. We're on a public road with a great big entourage, and there is a flash of light there is sound, and I mean, this was not something that wasn't noticed. But the biggest thing about this whole thing that strikes me is, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. <laughs> he knows what you've done. Some people won't come to Jesus, but they said, you know, if he knew what I'd done, I, you know, he wouldn't accept me. He already knows what you've done. That's the point. He knows what you've done and He still loves you. What human can you say that about? Well, maybe us. Because we've been touched by Jesus. And He's taught us this is how we should be. But this is broad daylight. What you've done, you did in broad daylight. Even if you think you did it under cover of darkness, He knows what you've done. Period. Number two, the only word I can think of that describes the story in its entirety is the word turnaround. I mean, Jesus changed his direction. He took the charging bull, the charging train, and wham, he's, he's not persecuting. He's preaching. He's not against Jesus. He says he's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's completely turned around. He's completely changed direction. He was already a believer in God. Many, many religious people today who believe in God need to turn around because they need to see Jesus. And whether we're talking about other religions or whether we're talking about people who claim Jesus but don't act like Him or whatever we're talking about, being a religious person does not mean you don't need to change directions. And this is the word for repentance. Repent. I was going this way, I changed, and now I'm going that way. I was a sinner, and now I'm a saint. I wasn't sure, and now I'm convinced. You know, everything about it turns around. Number three, misfortune is still a reality. Thank you for the song. I've never heard that verse that reminds us, you know, there's troubles to be had along the way. It's part, and you know, God does not stop our troubles. Some of us have had COVID. Several of us have had COVID. We have some that have COVID right, th right now. We have not had an outbreak. There has been no trace to this auditorium or to our classes or to our events. The people who got sick with COVID got sick somewhere else. I don't know how to say, you know, God's protecting us, well, and yet several of us have had COVID. You know, he doesn't take away everything, but he is a protector and he can do Things that make it not as bad as it could have been. Saul, you're going to follow me, but you're going to suffer. You change your direction and you go against these guys, you know how they are because you were one of them. He was already spiritually blind and he became physically blind for three days and he had no idea where he was going. Misfortune may be the thing that's gnawing on your heart right now. You're wondering, why is my life in such a mess? I don't know where I'm going. If you're asking that question, just realize that Jesus is standing saying, I am Jesus. 
Change your direction. Follow me. Fourth, this was an encounter. Now again, I, I don't believe the situation on the road was a salvation experience except that it was part of the salvation experience. But it was an introduction, not a lecture. And that's good for us in several ways. Number one, truth is light. Light can be blinding, but light is already blinding. We don't have to show it into someone's eyes until they hurt and they're physically blind. You know, it was a flash of light. There was no lecture. Jesus only asked the question and told him to go into the city. That's it. You know, as a parent, he's a failure. You really should have about a three or four paragraph lecture at this point, right? No? He only needed one thing, and he gave him that one thing, and it was an introduction. This is not forced submission. Saul was not saved against his will on the road. Saul was given time to think about it. Saul was presented with a fact that he refused to see, and that's as far as God would go. Okay, now, come to terms. Find your balance again. Where are you going to go? Can Saul say no now? Absolutely. All he has to do is say, I don't like you, Ananias. Just get out of the room. We're done. He got his sight back. He can go on down the road. But he'll have to deal with Jesus again. You can almost be sure of it. We need to give introductions and not lectures. And we don't need to focus on the fear factor. You know, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. That, that, those words should never come out of our mouths. That's not a motivation, folks. It's a reason. It's true. Jesus didn't use that one. You're not going to find that in these conversion accounts. That's not how you draw someone. <laughs> I know that should be obvious, but it's, you know, sometimes it's not obvious. But having said that, there is urgency. Ananias apparently said to Saul, why do you wait? Why do you tarry, King James? What are you waiting on? You've spent three days thinking about this. You've got your sight. Now get up and be baptized. And call on his name. This much I'll say about tonight. What do you need to do, Saul? You need to know and you need to say who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. He is Lord. He is Son of God. Call that a confession, if you will. The prophets called it the process of salvation. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And yeah, if you haven't heard anything else, understand you've got to do more than say a few words. Three days blind, and all the things that were going on in his heart should be all the evidence you need that there was so much more involved, there was a complete and total life change that happened over the course of those days. And as soon as he found out what he could do to write everything, he was, he was in the water. And that was that. So my question this morning is, why do you wait? If life's been trouble and you're wanting to write everything and you want to find that balance again, or maybe balance you've never known, that balance is in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ knows what you've done. And He's calling anyway. So come calling His name. He's the one who will save you. While we stand and sing.